Do you ever have super random thoughts like wondering if there are more wheels or doors in the world? Or is that just me? What's cracking, Eidolonas? With World 1 and its mechanics out of the way, we are moving on to my spiritual home in Eidolon, the Desert World. World 2, and crikey, she's a beaut, so let's get right into it, shall we? Oh, make sure to stick around right to the end of the video, as that's where I'll be putting any stills people may want to screenshot for later reference. Okay, now we can get into it. Upon defeating Amarok and opening up the portal to World 2, there's one super important thing that we need to do before anything else, and that is to cycle through all of our characters, take them to World 2, and click on the cauldron. Doing this will activate our characters within the alchemy skill, which we'll go into more shortly, but for now, just pop at least one character into the orange, green, and purple cauldrons. With that done, our next goal should be to upgrade our character's armor and accuracy so we can start pushing into the maps of World 2. We want to get everyone to the third map as soon as we can. This means we want to get 53 defense and 180 accuracy if not surpassing those numbers so we have 100% survivability and accuracy while pushing through the first few maps. While we're on the topic of defense and accuracy, this is the perfect time to go over what equipment I was personally aiming for by the time that I finished World 2. As far as combat armor goes, the Amarok boots, legs and chest are the go-to here. Using World 2 stones on this set and having two elf twist rings will give you plenty of defense. As far as helmets go, the Amarok helm is not worth the time investment required. So for our warriors and archers, we want to go for the militia helm and thiefhood respectively. While our mages, I like to continue the Prometheus quest line and complete Slovakian scare. This will give us the alien headband, which gives us a 10% boost to our mana regen. Again, you want to use World 2 stones on all of these. With this, we should be set for World 2. We'll cover skilling gear when I go over skills a bit later on. The reason we want to reach the Desert Dunes map is because this lazing legend doing his best Snorlax impression is our secondary class trainer. Secondary classes are huge for increasing both AFK gains and specializing further into skills. They are also why I mentioned you want to have two warriors, two mages, and two archers within your first six characters. This will allow you to get one of each secondary class, which we will go over briefly here. Something to quickly note here for the secondary class quest, the items required to finish the quest are not consumed upon completion. So once you have finished the quest on one character, you can pass them to your other characters through the chest to get it done a bit quicker on them. Anywho, our warriors can choose to become either a squire or a barbarian. Squires specialize in construction, which is a world 3 skill, so I won't be going over that in any capacity here, but these guys are great to keep your oars flowing early on. Personally, I like to max out the last talent in the squires tab first, so I can max out the mining related talents in the warrior tab as soon as possible, then throwing my squire on mining until we get to world 3. Barbarians, on the other hand, specialize in fishing and are also the best class to push to World 4 on if you're specifically going for speed. This talent here gives our kills a chance to count for 2 when opening portals. I like to push it to level 74 eventually, which gives us a 60% chance for this to trigger. Fishing, on the other hand, I'll cover in the skills section later on. Our archers can choose between either a bowman or a hunter. Hunters specialize in the World 3 skill trapping, so I won't be touching on that skill in this video either. Hunters can get high AFK kills per hour, so I like to use them to farm out materials for equipment that I want to make, upgrading stamps, and also upgrading bubbles. Again, more on those soon. Hunters also have a skill called Ludi McShooty, which I will go over in detail towards the end of the video as it overlaps with a World 5 mechanic that we should start thinking about now. Bowmen, on the other hand, specialize in bug catching, which is what they will predominantly be doing for the foreseeable future. While catching bugs and, of course, opening up portals to get to different types of bugs to catch. Sorry, I can't really hype this guy up, but more on bug catching soon. And finally, our mages can choose to become either a wizard or a shaman. Wizards follow the pattern and specialize in worship, which is a world 3 skill, you guys know the drill by now, but similar to the squire, this guy is my go-to woodcutter. Using the same method to max out our cutting talents, we will be able to keep our chests nicely stocked with all of the lumber we need heading into world 3. Shamans specialize in alchemy. An early game, I'm not going to lie, they're kind of meh, but just wait, shamans certainly get their time to shine. 
They still have uses early on. Our shamans, like hunters, have good kills per hour AFK, so are good for farming out materials or rare materials like glass shards and nugget cakes. They are also our go-to character for anything alchemy related because of this bubble breakthrough skill which should be maxed as soon as possible. This will give us a massive boost to our chance to unlock new bubbles. Okay, now that we know what each class is good at, we can move on. But before we can move on to the skills of World 2, there's one thing we should do in World 1 if we haven't yet. And that is to open the very last portal on a couple of characters. This is important as the materials from this map, both the Giga Frog Horns and the Forest Fibers, are required for the Amarok Equips and also the second tab of the Anvil, which you will want to unlock as soon as possible. Alrighty, without further ado, let's go over the skills introduced in World 2. Bug catching is up first. Throughout the maps in Eidolon, you will see various bug nests that once clicked on, bugs will come out of, allowing you to start catching them. Increasing how many bugs you catch per hour is a slow but important process, as bugs are required for various crafting recipes and fruit flies, the last bug in World 2 will be very important moving forward. Anyway, to do this, we want to unlock the higher tier nets from the unlocks tab in the task board and craft these. Gather the cards from each of the different types of bugs and level these up. There are stamps and bubbles that also increase catching efficiency and tool power. A pair of- Hi, my name as some of you'll know is Brian. Llama is an idiot. And balked this entire part of the script and he didn't even realize till it was too late. Thankfully I'm here to save the day. There's a pair of boots, pants, chest and a helm that all increase catching efficiency. Alrighty back to the idiot now. Finally, there is a boost food unlocked again from the tasks unlock tab, and that increases your catching speed. Next up is fishing, and most of what I just said about bug catching can be applied to fishing as far as increasing how many fish you catch per hour. The differences here are in the line and lure system. Clicking on the rack of fishing rods in any of the fishing maps which are to the left of the World 2 town will bring up this small interface which allows you to swap between different lines and lures. Each one affects fishing in various ways, from targeting specific fish, increasing experience gain, fishing speed, and fishing power. Experience, speed, and fishing power are fairly self-explanatory. The confusing part is the colored Xs. These are how you target different fish. These Xs refer to specific fish, I'll give an example for the small fish, and this will carry over to medium fish and large fish when you reach those. The green X refers to the easiest fish to catch on the map you're on, and the purple the hardest. Therefore, adding lures like this one will increase the likelihood of reeling in goldfish. This one would increase the likelihood of hermit cans. This one would increase jellyfish. And finally, this one would increase bloaches. You won't have access to all of these lures that I'm showing here to begin with. I'm showing some of these from my main account. Lines and lures can be found in shops, as quest rewards, and monster drops. There's also a boost food for fishing that you will unlock along with the catching one. And as for fishing gear, there is a pair of boots, a pair of pants, and a chest piece that you will want to work towards getting for your barbarian to really start reeling in those flushes. If you've been keeping up with your dungeon runs, now's a good time to start buying Rex Rings. These will help both bug catching and fishing. There's also a fishing related necklace that you can get from the dungeon shop as well. Tune in next episode. I'm obviously joking. Look at the link to this video. Alrighty, grab your notepads and a cuppa, settle back in, and let's go over alchemy. Alchemy is where I feel a lot of people struggle early on in Eidolon, and that's for good reason. It's a complicated skill. I plan on breaking down each tab in the alchemy window explaining what they contain and things to note, but to save this from getting too info dumpy, I'll display my goals for the bubbles as stills at the end of each video as we progress through the guide. We're going to go through these tabs in reverse order as I feel like it'll be cleaner and easier to understand overall, which means the pay to win tab is up first. I feel this is the simplest of the alchemy windows. The whole premise of this window is to spend the money that you earn in game to boost certain aspects of the alchemy skill and it is broken down into five sections. This panel down here is your sigils. We ignore their existence until much later in the game. These are a massive time sink, but you level these up by placing your characters into a sigil and they will slowly level it up passively over time. Nothing else needs to be done, but 
This means you're taking your characters out of cauldrons, which are far more important for now. Next to the sigils, we have the player panel. This boosts your alchemy speed and experience based on your highest alchemy level among your characters. You need to purchase these by clicking on these two boxes and tapping the upgrade button. You should keep both of these maxed out as you level up alchemy as these are blanket boosts that affect all cauldrons and all characters. To the top left, we have the cauldron panel. Clicking on any of the cauldrons here will allow you to level up the individual cauldron's speed, new bubble odds, and lower the cost of boosting that cauldron. The speed option here only increases the production speed of the specific cauldron being leveled. New bubble odds increases the odds of unlocking a new bubble. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock! And boost requirements I'll refer back to when we go through the brewing tab. Next to the brewing panel is the liquids panel, and they follow the same principle as the cauldrons. Clicking on one of the liquid cauldrons allows you to level up both the regeneration speed and capacity for each liquid. I feel like these are self-explanatory, but I'll touch a little more on these when I go over the liquid tab itself. And last but not least, we have the vials panel. This panel should be another high priority. Purchasing more daily attempts just flat out gives us more chances per day to unlock a new vial. And the RNG gives us a chance to roll an extra dice if we fail to get a vial. Speaking of vials, cue the seamless segue to the vials section of the video. Unlocking vials is something that you should attempt on a daily basis until you have unlocked all available vials. To unlock a vial, you simply need to drop a material onto the cauldron which will trigger a dice roll from 1 to 100. If you roll over the required number for the vial, it will be unlocked. The vials tab contains all currently unlocked vials. Looking at the top of the tab here, you will see how many daily attempts you have to unlock a new vial and a window that shows the next vial that you can unlock. A good thing to note here though is you can unlock vials in any order. If you don't have the material displayed in the next vial window but you have materials required for later vials, you can drop them to try and unlock those first. I'll scroll through all available vials now so you can check back if needed. I'll also try and remember to leave a link to all of the vials in the description. The last thing to do with vials is just like everything else in Eidolon, we can level these vials up. And leveling these up as you start producing larger quantities of materials and liquid is highly recommended. You need increasing amounts of the material used to unlock the vial, as well as some liquid to level these up. Speaking of liquid, okay, this tab looks intimidating, but don't stress, exactly 66.66% of this shit right here we're going to be ignoring until much later in the game. And even then, honestly. The three things we do want to pay attention to as we progress through Worlds 2 and 3 are the distilled water, the star book, and one measly gem. Distilled water should be purchased at least a couple of times a day as the cost scales each time you purchase some and the cost resets each day when your shop resets. I like to try and buy around five of these daily as they are used in quite a few recipes that we're looking to make moving forward. Starbook gives us the star talent TikTok, which increases AFK gains. Also, the tooltip here lies. The max level for this talent is actually 104, which you'll want to get to eventually, but anything over 50 will do for now. And one measly gem is exactly what it sounds like. You can buy one measly gem for liquid. Again, cost scales with each purchase, resetting daily. I like to try and buy two of these each day, which will end up costing you 25 water. Being free to play, we want to take advantage of every gem resource we can, especially with World 3 coming up soon. We will be spending a big chunk of gems there. Alright, with those out of the way, the only thing we have left is the cauldrons themselves. You can click on these cauldrons to level up both their capacity and regenerate using the liquid from the cauldron being leveled. As I said in the pay to win section, these are fairly self-explanatory. But for the sake of thoroughness, the capacity increases the amount of liquid that particular cauldron can hold, and regen rate increases how quickly you generate liquid. I will touch on a couple of other things in this tab when they become more important later game. How are we all going? We keeping up? Need to refill that cup yet? Come on Griffy, I can see your eyes glazing over bud. There'll be a quiz on this next week. Brewing is our final tab, and this is where a lot of the headaches come from in alchemy, mainly from knowing what levels to get certain bubbles to and when. Here I'll go over the mechanics of the tab, and as I said earlier, as we progress through the guide, I'll mention what levels I was personally pushing for on my account and why. Clicking on any four of these cauldrons will allow you to click and place your characters to the right here into the tab that opens up. 
When cauldrons have characters in them, you can see here how much charge is brewed per hour. The bar here shows how much brew is needed to generate one charge and charges can be stacked and you can see how many you have stacked up in this bubble here. These can be spent on two things. With the bubbles option highlighted, you can see here what the percentage chance is you will unlock a new bubble when clicking on this brew button. And unlocking these bubbles should be a consistent focus as you continue through Eidolon. With the boost option highlighted, we can see the other way to spend these charges. We have four options here. Speed, Luck, Cost and Extra. Speed increases brew speed generating charges faster. Luck increases your odds of brewing a new bubble. Cost reduces how many materials it costs to upgrade a bubble. And the times two extra is a bit different. Leveling this up gives you a chance to get two levels when leveling any four of these bonuses up. Each of these tabs are unique to each cauldron and need to be leveled up separately. This is also what the boost requirement from the pay to win tab lowers the cost of. There's no hard and fast rule on when to level these boosts. I'd say go with your gut. If you feel you're lacking speed or your chance to brew a new bubble is low, then throw a few charges into these boosts. As you continue to unlock new bubbles, you will notice some of these are big bubbles. These big bubbles can be equipped to your characters by clicking on the bubble itself and then on one of the circles next to your character in the character panel on the right here. If you're lucky enough to get the sheepy companion early on, you can forget about having to equip big bubbles altogether as sheepy will give you all of them all of the time. The last thing to note about this brewing tab and bubbles in general is clicking on any unlocked bubble will allow us to level up the bubble itself. This will require water from the liquids tab and some materials. Leveling these up is what will continue to push your account through the game. So to quickly recap, the pay to win tab increases various parts of alchemy by spending the money we earn in game. The vials tab is an ongoing project to push out and level up throughout the game. The liquids tab generates the liquids needed to fuel our alchemy and is also useful in crafting. And the brewing tab is used to unlock and level up bubbles. Alchemy is by far one of the biggest sources of, well, pretty much everything in the game. Do you want more damage, defense, accuracy, drop rate, skill efficiency, money, experience, and increased libido? You can get it all and more from Alchemy. So try not to ignore it. It's kind of like a puppy. It needs constant love and attention. Disclaimer, Alchemy doesn't actually affect your love life. Let's do a little stock take. We've gone over classes, equipment, skills. What else do we have to do in World 2? Uh, let's see. Post office, arcade, Kilroy, expeditions, and the boss. So not too much. That's sarcasm if you couldn't tell. I'm not going to be going over obels in this episode because in the grand scheme of things they aren't super useful just yet but any that you do get just throw in the family tab here for now. Arcade and Kilroy are both fairly simple so I'm going to rapid fire some straight up facts at you to get through those as quickly as I can. All right Arcade, talk to the clown, claim your balls, launch your balls, watch your balls drop, get rewards as part of the rewards you get golden balls they are spent here. This shop is on a rotation so I can't really tell you what to level up in this guide as these options are always changing but level up what you feel like you're lacking. P.S. Shiny chance is goaded. Kilroy is a weekly minigame you must enter on the display class. Get as high a kill count as you can. At the end of the timer, you'll get a few options. You can increase the timer for the minigame, get more talent points from the minigame, or get bonus skulls from the minigame. These skulls are spent in the skull shop. Most things in this shop are worth grabbing, depending on what you're wanting, just avoid the middle three on the top row. We're on the home straight now, we're almost there. The post office is up next, and is unlocked via doing the quest from the blobby light hiding in the mailbox up here. It requires making five empty boxes, with each box requiring four waters, meaning you will need to save up 20 distilled water just to get this done. Once unlocked though, you can check back on a daily basis for new orders that you will want to try and complete. Completing these orders will eventually unlock more orders to fill each day, and each one gives a small reward, but more importantly, it gives us boxes to spend in this upgrade tab here. For your skill in characters, you'll want to spend these boxes on the skill they specialize in. And as for your combat focus characters, the utility and fight boxes are pretty solid options here. Aim to get each of them to 200, that'll keep you going for a while. Maxing out these boxes is a long process, but certainly doable endgame. So it's not the end of the world if you have spent these on other boxes already. You can reset your post office boxes, but that is a gem shop item. So if you have balked these, you can reset them. But again, it's not something I'd suggest spending gems on. Because again, endgame, you'll have so many boxes that you can max everything if you want. Island Expeditions are a fairly new addition to Eidolon, and they will take you a few months to finish unlocking fully. The requirement to start Expeditions is simply reaching level 30 fishing, which you will probably do as you push through World 2. 
Upon entering the third fishing map, you'll be able to pick up these bottles, which can be spent unlocking islands at this notice board here. Each island has its own gimmick, and I haven't even finished unlocking them all on my main account yet, so I can't explain them all here. I would however suggest to unlock the Trash and Shimmer Islands first up, as these are both heavily time-gated and should keep you going until the next episode. The Trash Island has us doing the world a favour and picking up our rubbish. We can then spend our rubbish at this super sus looking dude flopping over here on the ground. You should focus on boosting both bottles and garbage first and purchasing the other bonuses as you push the cost of garbage higher than them. The Shimmer Island on the other hand gives us a weekly mission to try and push out a certain aspect of our account as much as we can to claim shimmers based on how high we can push that certain stat, DPS or skill the mission calls for. Once claimed, these shimmers can be spent at the Pink Fairy here. These are all good, so pick whatever you like. I just wouldn't go spending a ton on trying to get the Star Talent book just yet. Okay, I know I said this earlier, but now we're really on the home straight. We have Ethorn and the Ludi McShooty breakdown left. We have two options when it comes to obtaining Ethorn keys. Once you've reached the boss map, you can do the first two quests from the Genie Dude to unlock your daily keys just like we did with the Amarok boss fight. And this should be done on all characters eventually, but these quests require a fair bit more to complete, and even with the boosted drop rate on ghosts these days, it can still take a while. If you take this route, you'll need 200 average mana potions, 600 icing iron bites, and 150 jellyfish to complete the first quest, then you'll have to defeat 3000 moon men and collect one ghost to complete the second quest. The other option here is to fight in the World 2 Colosseum. Just as with the World 1 Colosseum, we can get boss keys from the chests at the end, and this can be a much faster option. With your boss keys in hand, you can now enter the boss fight whenever you're ready. I would suggest sticking around for the fight breakdown though. The e fight isn't too difficult. The hardest parts of the fight, we can cheese. We still want to go into this fight with some stacks of food as we will likely take some chip damage throughout the fight and we will want to face tank a few of the hits here and there. Ethorn has 6 arms, each with a different attack, and each of these arms need to be taken out to remove the shield over the boss's health bar. The fight slowly gets easier as we progress as once an arm is defeated, the boss will not be able to use that arm's ability anymore. The middle arms both use ranged attacks. The left one spawns columns of fire across the map and the right will shoot these wonky rings at you. With the gear we have, both of these attacks should be fairly easy to soak up. The top left and the lower right arms both use melee attacks. The lower right arm attacks quickly, swiping downwards and then doing a second quick poke, but doesn't hit all that hard, so I like to tank this one and get it down as quickly as possible. The top left though, the hammer will spin and then slam down onto both the top and the middle platform. The hammer hurts, so as soon as you see the hammer start to spin, run right to the back of the platform to dodge the attack. You can run back in as soon as the hammer falls down to the middle platform. And finally we have the lower left arm and the top right arm, which is where most people will fall victim to Ethorn. They both deal huge damage and the lower left finger gun will one shot you. Most of the issues come because the timing on these attacks is a little bit wonky, but luckily we can actually cheese both of these arms. We can achieve this on a few different classes. If you're a squire, you can stand on these platforms after defeating the arms that target them and use Shockwave Slash to attack the arm on the other side of the map. If you're a barbarian or a bowman, you can stand under each platform and use Bear Swipe and Axe Hurl for the barb and Homing Arrows for the bowman to slowly whittle down the dangerous arms. Finally, if you're a shaman, similar to the barb and the bowman, you can stand below the platform and use the vial throw to damage the arms, but you must land the vials close to the edge of the platform to deal damage. If you've pushed through on a wizard or a hunter, well, I'm sorry to say, but you're shit out of luck. As the souls people like to say, it's time to get good. I'd personally suggest defeating the arms in this order. Once all of the arms are defeated, we can finally attack Ethorn in his big stupid face, which again, if you have food, you should be able to just stand up here and take him down. Before long, you should be able to take this fella down without too much issue, earning you the boss crystal and access to World 3. Just one last thing to go over and we're done. As I mentioned in the class section, hunters have an ability called Ludi McShooty and it essentially functions exactly the same as a World 5 mechanic called the Slab. 
So if you're sitting there thinking this is hunter related, it doesn't apply to me, don't click off, this is important. For hunters, this ability boosts our damage. And as far as the slab goes, we'll get into that in a few videos time, but it is something that we should be conscious of before we lock ourselves out of certain items. These two systems count how many unique items you've picked up across your account as a sort of completionist's checklist. Now the important thing to note here is these items have to be physically picked up off the ground. For example, you should go back through and get bags A, B and C as the quest rewards from World 1. Drop these from your inventory onto the ground and pick them back up. This ensures that that item is counted for both Ludi McShooty and the slab. This rule applies to every item in the game. Anything you craft for the first time, drop it like it's hot, and then pick it back up again. All shop items, all quest rewards, even gem shop items, they all count for the slab, so it's good to get into the habit of dropping and picking up items whenever obtaining them for the first time. You'll thank yourself for doing this in the long run. This video was a massive effort to get together and my most ambitious project so far, so I'd really appreciate any feedback on whether you prefer these longer format videos or the shorter videos splitting the worlds into a couple individual videos. If you found this guide helpful or entertaining, please consider smashing that like button. And if you'd like to catch this playthrough live, consider checking out my Twitch, the link will be in the description. As stated earlier, I'll have some stills at the very end of this video showing my progression goals for certain points of world too, so stick around for those. But with all that being said, I've been Titanic Llama, you've been watching a video, and I'm out. Peace.